The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. with Avisant. Avisant is a next-generation global consulting firm that has its finger on the pulse of the global economy. Join us for an exciting look at the world economy. Now, here is your host, Kevin Parikh. Good afternoon and welcome to Globe Talk with Avisant. It is Friday, November 19th. My name is Ravi Mahalingam. I'm Avisant's general counsel and I'm substituting for Kevin Parikh this week and Kevin will be back on next week's episode. On this week's broadcast of Globe Talk, we continue our focus on the globalization of services, which has defined the modern global economy. We will speak today with Shiv Graywell, who is a senior corporate partner with the law firm of Straddling Yucca Carlson and Roth, based in Orange County, California. Mr. Graywell is a corporate and securities lawyer by training and has put those skills to develop an extensive and robust practice with Indian companies and entrepreneurs. Shiv's work has contributed significantly to the growth of several Indian companies, and his firm has enabled many U.S. and Indian companies to expand their scope of international business. Shiv, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining. Uh, Thank you, Ravi. Shiv, could you tell our audience a little bit about your career path? Uh, What brought you to the practice of law and to Southern California in particular? Yeah, actually, it's an interesting story. It's a long story, but I'll make it short. Um, I did my, uh, my, my law degree in India and was actually a practicing lawyer in India for seven years. And um, at some stage decided maybe it's a good time to do a degree in the U.S., a master's degree in law, and do it before my practice gets too robust that I won't have time to do it. And so uh, my wife and I, I was married at that time, decided let's just go there for a quick uh, master's degree in law. I had admission at the University of Pennsylvania and... uh, they kept it open for three years. I kept changing my mind, and then the third time they said, look, they're not going to keep it open anymore. You either take it or we're going to drop the admission. So uh, I said, let's go. So we came down here to the States. It was a two-year course, but uh, if I worked crazy hours, I could do it in nine months. So that's what I decided because uh, it's an expensive program, and uh, the Indian rupee converted very poorly into U.S. dollars, so I didn't have the cash to do a two-year course. Um, nine months it was, it flew by, did well, and uh, then was looking forward to going back to regain my practice in India. And the then finance minister of India, who is currently the Indian prime minister, a gentleman called Manmohan Singh, decided to open up the Indian economy. And I thought to myself, maybe there's some possibility of leveraging my Indian expertise and working with U.S. companies here, and maybe I should try and get a job here, see how that works out. And my wife was fully supportive of that. And uh, so I started looking around for a job in the U.S. and um, discovered that since I hadn't done my bachelor's degree in the U.S., very few law firms were looking to hire me. So I sent out 130 applications to get hired in different law firms all across the country, and I got 129 ding letters saying, sorry, but uh, no thanks. And there was one law firm which was uh, based in Los Angeles that sent me a letter and said, look, why don't you come by when you're in Los Angeles for an interview, which was code language for saying they're not going to pay your airfare, you pay your own freight, and then come here for an interview. And I was so broke by then, I didn't have money to buy a plane ticket to come to Los Angeles. But uh, American Express had a special on campus if you applied for their credit card, they gave you a voucher for you to fly out on a return ticket anywhere within the U.S. And I applied for that card, and they said, it's going to take you two months to get the voucher. Called the law firm here and said, look, I'm really busy. I'm doing my paper. I don't have time to fly out. i got two months more. Before I finish my paper, they said, fine, no hurry. Take your time. 
which should have been a signal to me that they aren't really serious about it. But in any event, long story short, the voucher came. I flew down to Los Angeles, came in for my interview, and um, discovered that the person who was going to interview me had gone out and uh, for a client meeting hadn't come back, so there was no one to meet me. And I think the receptionist ran around the office looking for someone, found the head of the corporate group at the law firm, and uh, uh, he agreed to spend 10 minutes with me. I actually sat down with him, and uh, turned out we got on famously. And uh, as they say, fate in these things, he had just closed a transaction where one of his clients had bought an Indian company. And the lead attorney for the Indian company was one of my reference letters. And I mean, this is we are talking about 1990, so uh, you can imagine how fortuitous this was because there wasn't too much trade between the U.S. and India. So our 10-minute conversation turned out to be an hour and a half. And uh, I came back to Philadelphia, and the next morning I got a call from him saying, why don't you join us? We'd love to have you on board. And again, this was 1990, which was perhaps a year before the recession of the early 90s hit the U.S. So it was all, as they say, fate. At least in India, we call this fate. And uh, I accepted the offer, and that's how I moved to Los Angeles. And uh, once you're in Los Angeles, the weather, <laughs> you can't go anywhere else in the country. Uh, that's yeah, that, that is a fascinating story, Shiv. I mean, it just sounds like uh, uh, that at any point you could have just uh, quit and gone back to India and resumed a, a fine career as, a, as an Indian corporate lawyer. But uh, what, a, what a great story. Uh, that I'm glad our audience has had a chance to hear that. Um, so at what point... Did you see the potential of developing an international practice that focused on India's emerging markets? Was it uh, uh, at the time that Manmohan Singh was the, was the finance minister? Is that where you got the, the vision or the drive, or did it develop uh, as you started doing more projects at, uh, at Stradling? Well, actually, it was in 1990 when Manmohan Singh opened up the Indian economy that uh, <clears throat> the initial thought came to my mind that there is some opportunity here. Unfortunately, when I delved into it deeper, I realized that most people in the U.S. still looked at India, and this is serious, as a land of snakes and elephants, and a lot of the discussions I would have with people showed how ignorant they were about India. Right. And so there wasn't too much going on in cross-border work. Uh, I think what really opened up India was, and I, you may remember this, Y2K, because Y2K, or the year 2000, uh, um, computer change required so much software programming to be done, and the U.S. just did not have the resources to do it. And that's when a lot of the Indian software companies started getting involved with the U.S. markets. And because there was so much more cross-border interaction going on, the Indian government had to act in opening up the economy rapidly and even more. It was a very closed economy and uh, very uh, controlled by licenses, etc., but uh, the Y2K boom with Indian software forced the Indian government to rapidly open up the economy. And I think it's after that that we started seeing a lot, lot more cross-border trade. So would you say that uh, the, the Y2K uh, event, which you know, I recall very well as being a sort of a three-, four-year run-up of intense activity in the, in the IT space, uh, did that sort of catapult your own practice here in the United States? Yes, it did in terms of uh, at least the India-U.S. Uh, activity. And the reason is because I, I go back to India a lot, at least once a quarter. And I was doing that even in those days. So my network in India was pretty vast and robust. But the problem was there just wasn't enough trade going on. And, uh, you know, a little-known fact is that India has, uh, even today, I guess, uh, the second most listed companies on their stock exchange after the U.S., they're a very vibrant stock exchange. They're all the appropriate criteria that would require the economy to mirror the U.S. economy, except it was tightly controlled by the government. And I think once those first strings and those, uh, the other various government controls started opening up, I think you started seeing a lot more entrepreneurial activity between the two countries. And yeah, so I would say close to the end of uh, the 90s, is when we started seeing a lot more activity. That was one. And secondly, there was a big boom in uh, the technology space, uh, in the public markets in the U.S. And um, the issue became, I don't know if you recall this, that the stock markets in the late 90s were at historic highs. And there were tech companies going public, being bought out. There was so much activity in that area. And there were a lot of Indian engineers here 
who were uh, either starting technology companies or who were in senior positions in various U.S.-based technology companies, and they were increasingly looking at international markets, both in terms of uh, software programming as well as markets where they could sell their products. And because of the Indian influence, India was a prime target. So I think that added as an additional fillip to uh, the two-way trade. Yeah, that's a great um, sort of short historical overview of uh, what propelled uh, India's emergence into the global economy. I mean, you're looking at uh, actions by government on the one hand at the beginning of the decade of the 90s, and then um, and then the actions in the in the private sector with the growth of uh, the, the the technology market and uh, the the Nasdaq boom, if you will, Nasdaq bubble that turned out to be, and of course the the Y2K uh, development. So it's a it's a great uh, synopsis, and you uh, you just happen to be in the right place at the right time and and had the skill set to take advantage of that to develop a a rather unique practice here in Southern California. Um, yeah, well, you know, Ravi, as they say, timing is everything. And you could call it luck, you could call it fate, but it's all timing. It's <laughs> very rarely in your own hands. It's just fortuitous. So we have uh, uh, time for maybe one more question before we have to go to a break. But let me ask you this. Uh, do you view your international practice at Stradling as a two-way street? In other words, do you advise U.S. companies on doing business in India as well as help Indian companies do business within the U.S.? Yes, I, I do both, and um, but uh, I take a much more active role in advising Indian companies investing in the U.S. I have a whole network of Indian law firms who I've dealt with previously, who I deal with when there's a U.S. entity looking to uh, set up operations in India. I can give them advice here, but the actual legal and commercial work is done by uh, local firms in India. But you still remain as the point of contact with your uh, American-based clients to make sure that everything is um, aligned properly to the client's expectations. And your yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I act as the interface. Mm-hmm. I make sure that the, they're, they're speaking the same language because Indian professionals very often uh, may say something but mean a different thing uh, to a U.S. audience. So you have to make sure that the translation works, and I mean translation, not language translation, but the meaning of various sentences and uh, to make sure that uh, the U.S. company is being serviced appropriately and is getting it done at the appropriate timeline uh, which they're used to when they're dealing with U.S. professionals. And uh, as far as assisting Indian companies doing business in the U.S., um, I think we will get back to that when we uh, get to our get through our commercial break. But uh, thanks very much, Shiv. We'll return after these messages. Sounds good. Thank you. <music> When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. Avasat, your management consulting firm for the next generation, providing sourcing advisory, globalization, and go-to-market strategies. In an unpredictable world, Avasat is your trusted global advisor. Learn more about us. Go to www.avasat.com. That's A-V-A-S-A-N-T.com. Providing global sourcing solutions for IT and business process services. We offer call center sales and support services at the highest industry standards. Cape Source, world class IT services straight from the heart of Africa. Learn more about us on the web at www.capesource.org. Tune in to It's Your Money with host Bill Pfeifferlich. You'll get an eye-opening education about some of the misconceptions of the financial world. If you are a business owner, working professional, or successful American, you will benefit from the information on our program. Our guests will include financial service professionals, international tax and estate attorneys, and CPAs. We'll identify solutions that you can implement now to get the most of your money. Tune in Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time for It's Your Money on Voice America Business. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. to 
Talk with Avasant. We're here to answer your questions about the global economy. Please send an email to globetalk at avasant.com. That's globetalk at avasant, A-V-A-S-A-N-T dot com. Now, back to our program. Here's Kevin Parikh. Hello, everyone. We're back on Globe Talk with Avasant. My name is Ravi Mahalingam, substituting for Kevin Parikh this week. We're going to continue our discussion with Shiv Grewal of the law firm Straddling Yucca Carlson and Roth, based in Orange County. Uh, Shiv, uh, we left the last segment talking about your international practice. Um, and the question that I had going into the break was do you view it as a two way street? Do you advise U.S. companies doing business in India as well as? helping Indian companies do business within the U.S. I think we uh, addressed the issue of how you assist U.S. companies, but I wanted to dive in a little bit more into how you help Indian companies do business in the United States. Well, it, <clears throat> that's actually it's an interesting uh, question, and the reason is because you wear, or at least I wear, many hats when I'm working with Indian companies. It's not just a lawyer's hat, because a lot of them have to be advised on certain uh, aspects of how you do business in the U.S., and uh, let me give you an example. Uh, in the early years, uh, talking about the early years of this decade itself, when Indian companies wanted to expand into the United States, they would generally send out a two- or three- or four-man team as an outpost and try and grow organically. And that never worked because they would send Indians from India who really never worked in the U.S., had no network here, had no idea how the systems worked, and um, it became an exercise in futility. They just couldn't grow fast enough. And so over a period of time, they realized, and this was advice based partly on experience, partly on advisors like me, telling them that you really need to build a U.S. base, acquire companies here, bring in teams that are already working in the United States, who already have networks, who've already worked the U.S. market before. And so there has been a shift in the last four or five years excuse me, where you have seen a lot of these companies from India coming in, actually now acquiring rather than just setting up outposts here and bringing in U.S. teams and employees and uh, working with them to expand further and look for further acquisitions. So there has been a significant uptick in acquisitions by U.S. Com- uh, by Indian companies in the United States. Well, that's very interesting because it sounds like your role um, goes beyond sort of the traditional view people have of, of lawyers as either um, suing people or um, drafting contracts. Instead, you were more of a business advisor here, a strategic advisor in this respect, where you have advised a lot of companies to uh, grow by acquisition and uh, and find a way to overcome what would might be viewed as uh, cultural barriers um, between India and the U.S. and to bridge that gap. Yeah, I, I think I think the best word would be to use in that would be I guess act like a counselor, which encompasses many hats. And it's a lawyer, it's an investment banker, it's a, an advisor on cultural sensibilities, it's an advisor on how to do business in the U.S. So you're right, it is uh, it is many hats, and uh, actually that makes uh, the practice a lot more interesting. Never a dull moment. I, I believe that. So um, one of the items you mentioned was uh, acting as an investment banker. So how much of your work with with Indian companies involves uh, venture financing? Uh, in addition to structuring transactions, are you involved in, in arranging or bringing venture capital interests to the table to fund and support such companies? Yes, and it's, a, it's sort of a two-part question. One is uh, companies that are based in India but have some sort of a U.S. Technology companies all look to the U.S. as a big market. Even though they may be based in India, at some stage they'd like to come in and uh, – set up a shop in the United States. But what's happened again in the last decade, uh, a lot of the U.S. venture capitalists have started funds that are focusing on the Indian markets, and they either uh, raise the capital here or through some of the other Asian markets. And so India now has a number of venture funds, all of whom have some connection to the United States, and are very active in the Indian VC market. So... A number of them also have the mandate uh, that if some of these companies are based in the United States but have a back office in India, they can invest in the U.S. entity also. So one of the roles that I would play is trying to match some of these companies, whether they're based in India or in the United States, with appropriate sources of money in India. And uh, 
If it's a pure U.S. entity, that's a whole different discussion. But if it's an entity which has an Indian connection, then uh, you, it's, if you have a fascinating situation that you have venture capitalists both in India and in the United States that are now looking to make those investments. And uh, I think as an attorney and as an advisor who has a network with a lot of the venture capitalists, it's um, one of the services we do provide and that I enjoy is matching the sources of financing to the corporates that need those uh, monies. That's very interesting, Shiv. I, I think um, uh, I think it's very illuminating to our audience. Uh, you've been involved with the organization TIE, uh, which I believe stands for the Indus Entrepreneurs, which seems to have grown in significance as India's prominence in the global economy has increased. Can you tell our audience a little bit about TIE and what you have done in that organization? How has participation in TIE uh, helped your practice? So a little bit of history on TIE. TIE started in the mid-90s in Silicon Valley. And you're right, the acronym stands for the Indus Entrepreneurs, Indus being uh, the whole river system in South Asia that used to feed uh, uh, that region. And uh, the initial membership of Thai came from South Asia, whether it's from India, Sri Lanka, or Pakistan and Bangladesh, though primarily I'd say 90% were Indian. And uh, it actually became a networking uh, organization, or it started as a networking organization, for the various uh, members from the community that were involved in the technology industry based in the Silicon Valley. And it started more as a, let's say, hi, hello, once a month. And over time, they decided, look, let's, there's so much entrepreneurship going on in the Silicon Valley. Let's try and build a mentoring organization from our, some of our successful entrepreneurs that we can provide knowledge, uh, perhaps capital, some training resources, uh, access to um, employees, and uh, just provide a whole mentorship package to a would-be entrepreneur. And that's the best way to give back to the community. Not to give money as charity, but to enable someone else who has a vision, the dream, and the drive to create their own company and you know, create employment, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the original founding tenets of the organization. And over time, it has now grown to be the largest organization in the world fostering entrepreneurship. So the aim is unabashedly the creation of wealth. Even though the organization is a nonprofit, it doesn't make any cash, and all of the members really join to give back rather than take. Uh, but by giving, you're actually taking because you meet so many like-minded people, you build a lot of lasting friendships within the organization. It seems to be a, a model uh, in terms of a... Uh, how to build a networking organization. It seems to have grown in effectiveness over the years. Uh, you, in, on that note, you've also been involved personally in a couple of India-based endeavors. What industries were those in, and can you tell us a little bit about those activities? Sure. In the early 90s, I was approached by uh, a visionary called uh, Mr. Gurjot Singh Khalsa, and he had this, what I thought was a crazy idea at that stage, of setting up a medical transcription business in the in, in India. And uh, in, in those days, you never had any service companies based in India because uh, everyone was scared that you know, the electricity would shut off, there'd be a coup, who knows what. India was just not a source of services in the early 90s. But uh, he, he convinced me, I met him, uh, he was a man of great conviction, and I then started working with him to get the company financed. And we finally set up operations in India for medical transcription services to doctors in the United States. And it spawned a massive industry. That was the first company that started it, and it spawned a massive medical transcription industry in India over the next decade, decade and a half. And it's still prospering, still, still flourishing. And that company, uh, Healthscribe, was the path blazer for that industry. And uh, the second entity, interestingly enough, uh, came our uh, Healthscribe became a mature company, and unfortunately, the venture capitalists took it over. And Mr. Khalsa and I said, what do we do next? This was a great experience. We had a lot of fun. What other path-blazing venture could we look at? And we focused on the call center industry. And he and I worked at it, he on the business side, me, and trying to get the appropriate financing sources to fund this venture. And we managed to get that off the ground. I got in the, the capital. He got in the technology. 
And we started India's first independent call center in the mid-90s, and uh, uh, which again was a pathbreaker in its own way, though it was such a natural for India. Um, and that started a huge boom in the call center business. Uh, but that was the first one. That company got acquired and taken public later later on. It was a company called First String. Uh, but yeah, those two endeavors were... And so for me, even though I didn't make enough money out of any of those, it was great satisfaction of um, creating industries that actually became uh, uh, national, nationally known and uh, really flourished in India. Uh, those are two fascinating examples. I, I could imagine that you could write a book on those two as case studies, which I think would be taught at uh, every single uh, business school in the country, because uh, they seem to have been very pivotal in the development of uh, India's technology services industry as we know it today. Uh, what do you see as the future for U.S.-Indian commercial relations over the next five to ten years? Will the relationship still be predominantly focused on India as a provider of technology services, or will India emerge as a significant consumer market for U.S.-produced goods and services? And one reason I ask this question is, as we know, President Obama was recently in India, and he very famously uh, held a press conference in which he announced the signing of several new commercial deals in which Indian companies are going to be buying products and services from American companies. And that was for the first time, in my view, that anyone looked at India as anything other than a technology services provider. They actually viewed it for the first time as a consumer market. What are your thoughts on that trend? Well, I think the trend started a while ago. I mean, India has always been a great consumer market. It's a democracy uh, where people have uh, uh, total choice where to spend their money, which is actually the first tenet for consumerism. And uh, with the opening up of all the various regulations, that now allow uh, non-Indian companies to sell into the Indian market, it has become really a mecca for consumer product companies and other industries that uh, are looking for a new market. So I think you're seeing pretty much all the U.S. multinationals now focusing on India, both on the consumer space as well as the industrial space, because let me give you an example. Uh, uh, even though this may in the short term be considered negative, India has a huge electricity problem. But in the long term, that's a great opportunity for people to either bring in power plant generators, looking at new technology, whether it's nuclear or otherwise. As you know, India and the U.S. have a nuclear pact for power production. And uh, every Indian manufacturing industry, for example, has to have that uh, has, has to have a backup generator made of diesel. Understood. And that's a huge market for generators. So a company like Cummins uh, has been selling generators in India for years. We have to go to break now, but uh, thank you very much, Shiv, for uh, giving us uh, some of your time today. I think it was a fascinating segment, and we hope to invite you back sometime in the future. Thank you, Ravi. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. the boardroom to you voice america business network go inside the world of pr with pr insider hosted by public relations expert maureen kettis maureen will speak to the world's highest profile pr pros from the fields of marketing advertising and sales and pr insider will feature renowned members of the media as special guests Maureen will give you a VIP access pass, including tips and tricks to take your business to the next level. PR Insider with Maureen Kettis, sponsored by Cision, us.cision.com. Listen every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Business Network. Cape Source, providing global sourcing solutions for IT and business process services. We offer call center sales and support services at the highest industry standards. Cape Source, world-class IT services straight from the heart of Africa. Learn more about us on the web at www.capesource.org.
Are you looking for innovative ideas on how to achieve your financial dreams? Tune in to Empirical Investing Radio every Thursday afternoon at 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern on the Voice America Business Channel. Join certified financial planners Ken Smith and Ethan Broga to learn how you can obtain financial success. You'll be entertained while you discover techniques to alleviate your financial concerns. Empirical Investing Radio every Thursday at 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern on the Voice America Business Channel. your management consulting firm for the next generation, providing sourcing advisory, globalization, and go-to-market strategies. In an unpredictable world, Avasan is your trusted global advisor. Learn more about us. Go to www.avasant.com. That's A-V-A-S-A-N-T.com. America Business Network, the bottom line in business. Good afternoon. Welcome to Globe Talk with Avasan. My name is Ravi Mahalingam. I'm Avasan's general counsel, and I'll be hosting this afternoon's broadcast in place of Kevin, who is out sick this week. Today, we're going to talk about the phenomenon of cloud computing, which is all the rage in the world of technology services. Our first guest is David Mihalchik, who is the business development executive for Google's federal practice. David has engineered Google's certification for cloud computing services for the federal government. Thank you for joining us, David. Thank you. Uh, most people associate Google with its Internet search engine and don't really identify it as an IT company as of yet. However, Google has had a very successful business line of email, calendar, voice, and document management applications, which more and more companies are adopting. How would you characterize the relative success of Google's foray into IT? I would characterize it as very successful. Uh, we have more than 3 million businesses now running Google Apps uh, with more than 30 million active users. Uh, and as an Internet company, our computing infrastructure is our competitive advantage. And we're well-placed to succeed in the cloud. The, the enterprise business itself was built on the realization that users want the same technology at work that they have at home. Uh, when, when they're at home, they have any time, anywhere access to their email. They don't worry about running out of space in their, in their email inbox. And for many users, that's not the same experience at work. And that enterprise technology in some ways has fallen behind. Uh, so enterprise is a top priority at Google from the executive team on down. It's considered a core business for us, uh, and we now have uh, more than 1,000 employees uh, working on Google Enterprise. So um, within the world of Google, is Google Enterprise viewed as a separate division, as like an IT services company that's distinct from uh, the, uh, the search engine and the advertising services that, uh, that run that side of the business? A totally different revenue stream? We are a division within Google. Mm -hmm. um, and of the 3 million uh, uh, business customers you mentioned, uh, do you have an idea of what the percentage breakdown is between, say, uh, larger enterprises of more than 100 employees and, and smaller enterprises uh, under that uh, number? It spans across the board. We, we have uh, users adopting at a rapid pace in the, uh, in the small and mid-market, and we have large uh, enterprises uh, as well. In the government space, we have uh, government customers in, in more than 30 states and federal government agencies as well. That's, that's very interesting. Um, another big development for Google's IT business has been um, its development of cloud computing services. Can you tell our audience what Google defines as cloud computing and why Google has chosen to aggressively develop a service offering in this area? Uh, absolutely. Uh, cloud computing refers to Internet-based computing, where software and information in data centers is sent over the Internet to computers, cell phones, uh, other devices. Uh, the technology enables people to quickly turn on applications and innovation like a utility instead of having to install and run their own applications. So data can be accessed anytime, anywhere from any Internet-connected device. I would say 
bottom line here is that we're, we're in the early days of a major technological change. And we're seeing people spending more time working in the cloud, collaborating in the cloud, and we expect that trend to continue and accelerate. And uh, I can say for, from our part, Avasan, we see uh, very similar trends uh, with our client base. Um, Google has made a big splash in the world of IT recently with the announcement that it is the first company to secure uh, Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA, certification to provide cloud computing services to federal agencies. Uh, can you tell our audience who may not be that familiar with the act, what is FISMA and what does this particular certification do for Google's overall standing as an IT company? Absolutely. Uh, FISMA is a requirement that all federal government agencies must meet by law. So all information technology systems must be evaluated under the FISMA security framework. It's a statutory requirement. And you're right, as you mentioned, in, in July we announced that Google Apps is the first cloud computing suite to receive a FISMA security authorization from the U.S. government, and, and in, in particular the U.S. General Services Administration. Uh, ob obtaining the, the certification for, for Google Apps is critical to government customers. Uh, they cannot run technology that is not uh, FISMA certified. That's, uh, again, a requirement uh, from Congress. What it, what it represents is um, really a, a green light from the, the U.S. government that agencies can move forward uh, to the cloud, and Google's cloud in particular, with confidence. Um, it was a top-to-bottom review process that took uh, almost a year, and we were evaluated on about uh, 200 specific controls that are defined as, as part of FISMA, and uh, we submitted about 1,500 pages to the General Services Administration that were reviewed and evaluated by both the GSA and an independent auditor. So uh, on the specific issue of the process uh, to get certification, we talk about 200 specific controls that you were required to comply with. Are these controls, uh, were they uh, revealed to you um, after signing uh, an NDA of some kind, or were they available, are they available to anyone who would like to provide uh, services to the government? The latter. They're, they're available as, uh, uh, as part of uh, a set of NIST controls that, that, that are available uh, and that the FISMA law is, uh, refers to and is based on. So these, these controls are publicly available, and again, they're the same controls that existing government agency uh, systems must meet. Right. Um, most people don't think of the federal government as an innovator in the technology space. At what point did, did Google realize that the federal government would be an ideal customer for your cutting-edge services, such as cloud computing? Well, I would say uh, government customers have been interested in Google Apps since we first introduced the product back in, in 2007. Um, and we've been listening closely to federal agencies and working to understand their unique requirements. What, what we're hearing is that agencies are spending too much for outdated technology. Uh, and that they're looking for a less costly, more powerful technology or solution. And that's what Google Apps is, is offering. Yeah, um, yeah, I think your, your question uh, reminds me of um, a, a statement that was made by uh, the outgoing uh, OMB director, uh, Peter Orzog, in, in talking about some of the challenges that the government is facing with IT right now and in cloud computing specifically, he said that uh, government has an opportunity to have a, uh, what he called a late mover advantage. And, and normally that, that's, that's not, being a late mover is, is not an advantage. But, but what he's referring to is, is the fact that government, which has some older and more outdated systems today, has the opportunity to move to the cloud and, and solutions like Google Apps that bring them up to date almost immediately and, and give them the, the power of the very latest technology. Uh, and, and Google's innovation and the best that we have to offer instantly. So it brings them back from, um, from maybe technology that in some cases it's, is 10 or 15 years behind and brings them immediately uh, up to date with uh, the very latest that is available. Now, Peter Orzag's uh, observation is uh, very insightful. It's uh, reminiscent of how a number of developing countries have advanced technologically by bypassing the industrial age and going straight to 
um, the virtual or wireless age. Exactly. Uh, the people who are familiar with the um, IT industry are some found it somewhat surprising that Google was the first to meet the FISMA requirements. I think you got into this a little bit in your uh, earlier answer to this question, but how difficult was it for Google to comply with FISMA? Did it require a concerted effort to re-engineer the security requirements for your premier uh, applications offerings, or was it the case that Google standards were already compliant and you mainly needed to tweak it um, to address um, certain particular uh, FISMA standards? Uh, we made no engineering changes to, to Google Apps in order to meet FISMA requirements. Uh, we, we did have to uh, create uh, uh, required documentation. But um, security is a, is a top priority uh, for, uh, for Google. And this was a top to bottom review of our security for Google Apps. And as I said, we, we examined uh, as part of the requirements a, a set of 200 controls. And, um, and, and, and it was about 1,500 pages in documentation that we submitted uh, to the government. So an, an extremely thorough review. And in fact, the agencies that have reviewed our package uh, have, have said uh, almost uniformly that the security of Google Apps is either as secure or more secure than the way that uh, agencies are, are running their existing systems today for, for email and for collaboration. Uh, one other point that I, that I would mention here is, is um, you mentioned some have, have found it um, surprising. I, I, I do think there is some, uh, some confusion in, uh, in the marketplace. There have been many uh, labels placed on, on cloud computing. And, and uh, as I said, I think that's created some confusion about, about the definition. But, but whether it's a, a public cloud or a private cloud or, or a community cloud, we really see these labels falling away because they're they're proxies for uh, for judging security, and and more and more moving forward, government agencies will look at uh, a cloud offering and see it's either FISMA certified or it's not FISMA certified, and it's either passed this top to bottom security review or it or it hasn't. So um, based on that, why do you think Google won the race? to be the first to receive federal government approval. Uh, do you think that maybe Google's um, applications and their interface and the engineering that, go, that, uh, that supports it was just uh, maybe uh, um, better suited for what the government needed? Was it just more developed because of the constant innovation that goes on uh, within, uh, within your company? Or uh, was it some other reason? I, I think really it speaks to our commitment to meet the government security requirements, and uh, it's it's another example of our of our leadership in in, in the cloud. Uh, Google is a cloud computing company. We we have um, you know more than ten years of experience of of providing uh, cloud cloud computing solutions, um, and and security is a is a top priority for us. We have you know. Uh, some of the top security experts in the world uh, that that work here. So, uh, so we think it's very important. Federal federal employees stand to benefit here from better collaboration, from from higher productivity uh, as a result of using Google Apps and more advanced technologies like Google Apps. So, uh, the FISMA certification is the key to to getting this technology in uh, in the hands of federal employees and, and other government users. So in essence, since Google um, started off as a, a somewhat of a virtual company providing cloud-type services and initially, it was well-positioned to adapt itself to FISMA. Right, and security, and, and, and security is something that, that was uh, n not something that was bolted on to, to our system. It was, it was baked in from, from the beginning um, as, as part of the uh, cloud computing system that we developed. So... Um, so I think that's an important factor as well. That's great. I think we're going to be heading to a commercial break now. Um, but we'll be back with uh, David Mahalchik of Google. Avasan, your management consulting firm for the next generation, providing sourcing advisory, globalization, go-to-market strategies. In an unpredictable world, Avasan is your trusted global advisor. Learn more about us. Go to www.avasant.com. That's A V A S A N T.com. When it 
comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. Talk with Avasant. We're here to answer your questions about the global economy. Please send an email to globetalk at avasant.com. That's globetalk at avasant, A V A S A N T.com. Now, back to our program. Here's Kevin Parikh. Welcome back to Globe Talk with Avasant. My name is Ravi Mahalingam. I'm Avasant's general counsel, and I'm standing in for Kevin Parikh, who is out sick today. Uh, we are going to continue our discussion now with uh, David Mihalchik of Google, and we are uh, mainly focused on the subject of Google's foray into cloud computing. So, David, as we've been discussing in the first part of this uh, of this interview, uh, cloud has a very broad meaning in the IT industry. Um, if you do a search on the internet, you, it can be all things to all people, uh, depending on what uh, article you pull up. So, as far as the um, federal government is concerned. What specific applications or capabilities is Google implementing to support the federal government? So our Google Apps technology, which is a software as a service platform, provides email, instant messaging, calendar, word processing, uh, and a, uh, a site capability, site creation capability for collaboration, and also video sharing capability. And uh, so really this is focused on, on messaging and collaboration. And the cloud offers opportunity for en enhanced collaboration is, is, is what we see. So the ability, to, for example, not only to do word processing, but to actually work in the same document at the same time with a group of five people or ten people and in remote locations so that co-editing can, can not be limited just to people in the same room or limited to having to uh, write a document yourself and then email it to someone else, but actually real-time collaboration in, in a document. And again, this is all driven by the fact that we see that these enterprise users, whether they be uh, federal employees or whether they be in the private sector, they're, they're looking for the same technology capabilities at work that they have at home. It, it used to be at work you had the best technology, but now more and more we're seeing that um, uh, employees have the best technology at home. They have a bigger inbox. They have a better capability to collaborate. Sometimes they have a faster Internet connection at home, and it's easier for users to access their consumer accounts than it is often for them to access their accounts at work. So in the case of the federal government, uh, the federal government is spending nearly $80 billion a year on information technology. They are the single largest uh, spender on information technology in the world. And, and yet the government is not regarded as a leader in information technology. So I think there's a, a general recognition that government is spending too much and that it's not getting the most out of, out of every dollar that it spends on IT. So, so the return on investment needs to be uh, increased, and I think this is, it's natural that the government is, is looking at cloud computing because it offers an opportunity to provide uh, less costly technology that is still more powerful. Uh, and, and all of the tools that I mentioned, real-time collaboration, video chat, the anywhere, anytime access, the better uptime and reliability, uh, this is very important for uh, telework initiatives in, in the federal government, for uh, managing uh, you know, potential disasters or, or disaster recovery situations, or situations where uh, workers are, are forced to work uh, remotely and unexpectedly. And again, this is all happening at, at a lower cost than what the government is, uh, is using its IT spend for today. So uh, you've mentioned uh, a couple of things I thought were interesting. One is the uh, is the issue of of cost containment um, and getting more value for for dollars spent. Um, this is something that we see a lot among private sector companies. What do you think is the imperative within the government to have uh, what seems to be a very similar attitude, trying to get more value for the dollar in terms of IT spend? Well, I I think the imperative is. Uh, meeting the obligation that government agencies have to the to the taxpayer and making sure that government agencies can best meet their mission, that they have the best tools uh, to meet their mission. 
So in terms of the incentives, um, instead of the uh, bottom line profit, it's, it's really about responsibility to the taxpayer and to uh, achieve the uh, the object, the stated objective of, of each particular uh, government agency. Correct. And have you found that in your experience to be a, a motivator on an equal level with that of the typical for-profit motive of a private sector company? I, I think that agencies are are always looking for uh, the best value and, and the best technology that that, that is available uh, to them. And I think that that uh, a number of, of, of federal government agencies uh, see email and collaboration as a very, very important tool that's available to, to employees. Uh, communication uh, and collaboration is, is extremely important to just about any agency's mission. So I think that agencies are taking a close look at this technology and they're looking at how they can get, better, get a better return on investment and how they can get uh, the, the best value for the taxpayer dollar. And when you talk about uh, real-time collaboration services or functionality, is that something that's available to um, standard consumers of, uh, of Google Apps today, or is this uh, something that is really meant for the enterprise or business-level customer? Um, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is in what ways um, are the services that are being rolled out to the government different from what is rolled out to say, a small business user or an individual user? Many of these capabilities are available to consumers. The difference for the enterprise is that um, we, uh, for example, more storage is is available to enterprise users. Uh, Association with the enterprise domain is available for our enterprise users. Access to a a, a set of APIs that are developed specifically for, for enterprise users. User support uh, is, is made available as, as part of the contract. And things like, uh, in the case of the government, the FISMA certification is made available as well. So, uh, so we, we definitely, uh, we, have a, we have a consumer product and we have, we've tailored the product for enterprises as well. And what specific agencies of the federal government is, is Google targeting? Uh, do you envision that the uh, that all government agencies will will become supported by Google, or do you have to? Are, are there some agencies which are better suited for your services than others? Well, we talk with federal government agencies uh, across the board in civilian and DoD and intelligence. And in fact, when it comes to our uh, to our enterprise technology portfolio, which includes Google Search and our geospatial technologies, Google Maps and and Google Earth for the enterprise. Uh, we have every executive level cabinet agency in the government is is using one or more of these enterprise technologies. Uh, specifically for Google Apps, uh, uh, Berkeley National Labs, part of the U.S. Department of Energy, has deployed Google Apps uh, for uh, over 4,000 employees and, and uh, an additional 1,000 research partners. There, they've uh, they expect to save about one and a half to two million dollars over the next five years from. Uh, from that technology change and that investment. Um, the U.S. Navy's inrelief.org uh, division is uh, using the suite to collaborate with NGOs and uh, foreign governments. Uh, that's for disaster relief scenarios. Uh, that's a, a particular use case where the collaboration capabilities uh, are very important. And um, uh, as we know, uh, as most Americans know, uh, the uh, health care law was passed um, earlier this year, the Affordable Care Act, um, and that is obviously going to have a great impact on the world of IT. Um, what do you think that the Department of Health and Human Services would need from a, from a cloud services basis in order to support the, and implement the changes that are uh, in the health care legislation? I, I think that uh, the Health and Human Services, like any federal agency, uh, needs a uh, a set of reliable tools that are easy for workers to use, that have anytime, anywhere access, that have uh, a, a, a great deal of email storage so that employees are not spending time worrying about uh, is their email box uh, full and do they have to take messages out and move them somewhere else so that they can just maintain regular communication throughout the day with, with the information that they need to be getting through email. I think they want to empower the workforce to be able to uh, collaborate from remote locations in order to increase productivity. 
And I think they're, they're like any agency, going to be very concerned about uh, security and meeting the requirements of, of FISBA and making sure that uh, they have the, the most up-to-date technology in terms of uh, the, the pace of innovation that, that is available to them, that they're not having to spend a time and resource managing uh, security patches that come out uh, at, at every couple of Tuesdays and, and worrying about um, exploits from, uh, from hackers from, from known uh, uh, vulnerabilities that, that that are published on a regular schedule uh, to, to their own system, and, and at the same time, know that they are not going to be worried about when the next upgrade needs to happen and when the next big investment in an upgrade needs to happen. Because with cloud computing solutions like Google Apps, uh, there is no version of of Google Apps. There's just one version. We're constantly updating the technology to provide uh, new capabilities. We've we've added since the introduction of, of Google Apps, uh, whole new capabilities. We added, for example, the Google Sites capability. We added the, the Google Video capability. Each year we're making hundreds of updates and improvements uh, to, to the technology. So uh, I, I think this is what HHS and, and other federal agencies are, are really closely examining. Great. Um, Microsoft seems to be one of Google's primary competitors in the race to be a provider of cloud computing services. And uh, I, I'm told we only have about a minute left, but as Microsoft is working to obtain FISMA certification, do you anticipate tough competition for federal government projects uh, from them? Do you think that benefit, that competition rather, will be a benefit to customers? Uh, I, I think um, competition is welcomed. Uh, and. And I think almost all the innovation in the coming years that we're going to see is going to come in the cloud. Um, and they're in the, you know, in, the, in the next generation, there, there's always room for, for more players, and uh, the, some of whom we may not even know about uh, today that are coming into the market. Great. Well, it was wonderful to have you on the show. We thank you very much for taking time out of what must be a very busy schedule to uh, inform our audience. Uh, Thanks very much, and uh, we would love to invite you back for another interview sometime in the future. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed Globe Talk with Avasant for this week. We'll be here again next Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, noon Pacific, on the Voice America Business Channel.